For this quiz, we're looking at Lewis diagrams and how that can show us about the geometry, the hybridization, the polarity, and a lot of properties that lead to the physical reasons why one substance is one way and another substance is another way. So to start, we're going to look at Lewis diagrams for two molecules, carbon dioxide and water. And the first question is asking about the Lewis diagrams. Remember that if we don't get the Lewis diagram well, it's going to be very difficult to determine the geometry as that is going to be based on the Lewis diagram. So for carbon dioxide, we have the following. Remember that carbon generally likes to make four bonds, oxygen likes to make two, and that leads us to this structure, which does have all the electrons placed and complete octets. That's something we should definitely expect for a molecule that's as stable and common as carbon dioxide. For water, we get the following, where we have this structure, oxygen likes two bonds, hydrogen likes to make one bond, and we have a central atom, the oxygen, which has two lone pairs. And note the differences in how we've drawn each of these as well. Because next we want to determine what the geometry is, and for the carbon dioxide, what we want to notice is it has two electron domains around that central carbon. And remember that the geometry is really going to be based only when we have a central atom as the oxygens here are terminal and they really don't have any geometry that they're determining. So with two electron domains around the carbon, this is the two double bonds, no lone pairs, so only two areas that electrons are going to live in, we end up having two bonding zones and zero lone pairs. And this determines a linear molecular geometry. Those two bonding zones want to be as far apart from each other as possible. In contrast, for water, we have four electron domains. There's two lone pairs and two bonded pairs. And this makes for a geometry that's actually going to be bent in this case. Water has a bent geometry, carbon dioxide has a linear geometry, and that's the answer to part A. For part a, B, we want to determine, well, one of these is polar while the other is nonpolar, and we want to determine which and explain why. And when we look at these, we want to look at the bonds. So when we have different atoms bonded to one another, we generally speaking have a unequal sharing of electrons, which is determined by the electronegativity, which is a property of atoms that determines how badly they want electrons in a covalent bond. And so while we do have polar bonds in both of these cases, the carbon-oxygen bonds and the oxygen-hydrogen bonds, carbon-oxygen and CO2, oxygen-hydrogen and water, what we see is that carbon dioxide is nonpolar because while these bonds are polar themselves, they're linear in this geometry and therefore they're pulling in opposite directions and they're going to cancel. Water is polar and this is because of its bent structure. It leads to a non-zero net dipole because these bond dipoles will be pointing inward and upward and that upward component is going to add to make a non-zero net dipole and a polar molecule. So that's the answer to this first one. Carbon dioxide nonpolar, water is polar. Water is liquid at room temperature while carbon dioxide is not. And that is based on this polarity. Next, we want to look at a more involved molecule. So here we have an amino acid. And we want to label the orbital hybridization of all the non-hydrogens. And uh, you know, keeping in mind that there are lone pairs that are not shown here, but definitely do exist. So let's see where those lone pairs are to begin with. They're going to be in these positions, one on the nitrogen, two on the oxygens, and this should be reminiscent of what we've, we've seen before, right? Note that all the carbons here are making four bonds. That CH2, that's to show that it's bonded to two hydrogens as well, which is um, really in a configuration just like the nitrogen is, but just shown more succinctly. Now, if we look at the hybridization, remember that this is based on how many electron domains we have. So for the nitrogen here, it has four electron domains. This is to say the three bonded pairs and the one lone pair. Four electron domains need accommodation. This means that we have sp3 orbitals. Those sp3 orbitals come from 1s orbital and 3p orbitals to create four new orbitals that we name sp3 to evenly space four electron domains. sp3 for carbon, again, four electron domains, and for this carbon, and for the oxygen, because even though two of them are lone pairs and there's two bonds for this one, still four electron domains, still sp3. Now, this carbon over here is going to be sp2 because we only have three electron domains on this carbon. 
One of them is a double bond, but remember that that's still a single electron domain. So we're spacing three equivalent electron domains and we use three equivalent orbitals, sp2, in order to do that. This oxygen is also going to be sp2 for the same reason. Two lone pairs, one bonded domain gives us three electron domains, so sp2. And this oxygen is going to be sp3 for the same reason as the other oxygen was sp3. Okay, so for part D, we're looking at this Lewis structure, bromine pentafluoride. We want to know the molecular geometry and the orbital hybridization of all of these atoms. And if we look at this one, we want to determine the molecular geometry and note that there are five bonds and one lone pair. That means that the electron geometry is going to be octahedral to accommodate for six domains, but the molecular geometry is square pyramidal. So basically that octahedral geometry with one bond removed makes it a pyramid with a square base, hence the name. For the orbital hybridization, note that the fluorines are all configured the same and then the bromine is configured differently. Bromine is going to have six electron domains, so sp3d2, while the fluorines are going to be sp3 for having four electron domains, one bond, three lone pairs for each.